Hello friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg and I am the Audiophiliac and today's show is kind of different because it's in three parts plus, of course, the Audiophiliac viewer system of the day. Now, by the way, I don't always announce it in the front, but there's almost always an Audiophiliac viewer system of the day, unless I'm doing an interview. But otherwise, it's pretty much there. But anyway, let's continue. So the three parts for today's show are my close encounter with the head, the president of a very large speaker company, and how weird that was. I'm not going to tell you who it is, unfortunately. But anyway, the second part is whatever happened to multi-channel audio, SACD, DVD audio, the physical discs, that is. And then the third part is my experiences of, well, what I've heard in recording studios versus audiophiles, systems at home. Well, the better ones at least, right? Okay, so let's start with part one. My close encounter with the president of a very large uh, speaker company, and uh, it was at a press event, and a lot of times at press events, they serve lunch. So we were eating lunch, and I just happened to sit right next to this guy. Nice guy, perfectly nice. And we were, you know, chit-chatting away. And then I said to him, you know, <laughs> just since you're right here, I want to ask you this very important question. When it comes to introducing, let's say, a new line of speakers, what is the most important thing, what are the most important things that you're thinking about for the launch of a new line? Sound quality, I assume sound quality is a biggie. Uh, marketing, uh, how it looks, of course, the price, et cetera, et cetera. And, well, he didn't really have much to say because I kept pushing him to say, well, is it really the sound quality? And he did not say a word. I said, well, then it's distribution and how you get it into stores and your international distribu distributors, you know, that sort of thing. He, I mean, this is a very short part of his three-parter because he didn't give me much, you know, that's the thing. But he wasn't at least going through the motions of saying, oh, yes, yes, we really care about sound quality. And every time we bring out a new line or new model year, it's going to be so much better than last year's. He didn't even go through that. And I said, by the way, it's off the record. And <laughs> that's why I'm not going to tell you what he, was, what he actually said. But he didn't give me much. Price is definitely a factor. The styling and how it looks. And back in those days, kind of early Internet days, uh, how it feels when you touch it, you know, the, the touchy-feely aspects of a, of a speaker, that's a part of it. But sound quality is too ephemeral. ephemeral. It's too hard to pin down. Some people want more bass, some people want less. People want great imaging or mid-range or soundstage, whatever it is. It's like pe different people want different things. So just a generalized, make it sound better than last year, hmm. To who? To, to, to what end? To, in what kind of situation? It's just, sound quality is, uh, is hard. It really is. Even for a company that's all about making speakers, it's not the first thing they think about when they're making the next generation of a speaker. Sorry. Sorry to burst any bubbles there, but that's the way it rolls. Now for part two. Well, part two. Well... You know, back in the day, in the turn of the century, from the 2000s, it was a big deal. SACD and DVD audio were competing formats, a format war, as we used to call them, right? But it really wasn't much of a war. It wasn't even a skirmish because there was so little action <laughs> on the sales floor. Okay, one of the strangest parts about the launch of these formats was how little content was created in high res for those formats, DVD audio slash SACD slash DSD. And for Sony, it was even weirder because Sony owned uh, a major record label, Columbia Records slash Sony. So did Sony's leading artists like Bob Dylan or Bruce Springsteen or Barbara Streisand, <laughs> whatever, did they bring out new music in those formats, well, in this case, SACD. No, there were reissues of their old back catalog, Billy Joel and Bob Dylan and stuff. Yeah, those came out on SACD. And then there was Bruce Springsteen. 
I mean, gee, he was a big deal. He still is a big deal. But he wasn't releasing his new music at that moment on SACD. And I kept thinking, if you guys are so in love with this new format you've created, why aren't your, your I was going to say living, why aren't your current artists embracing it and putting out eagerly, it sounds better, blah, blah, blah. But no, they did not. And on the, on, on the DVD audio side, Warner Brothers, Warner Music, was the leading proponent for DVD audio. And they had press conferences saying they were very excited. That's a word you hear a lot at press conferences. They were very, very excited about DVD audio. And they were planning to release you know, hundreds of uh, t titles this year, whatever year that was, 1999 or 2000. And yet... A month would go by and they'd release three. <laughs> Next month they'd release two and then they would release five. But hundreds, they were never going to get to hundreds releasing them in little handfuls at a time. And they, the president, the vice, one of the vice presidents of Warner Brothers would be conducting these press events. And I used to raise my hand and say, so, <laughs> so where, is, where are they? Where are these titles that you're so excited about? Okay, but here we are in 2022. And there is a considerable amount of high-resolution music available for download or streaming. Okay, I would say that's terrific, but to me, it really hasn't amounted to much. Yeah, on Tidal and Kobuz, the ones I use, yeah, I see there's a lot of it. When I say high-res, I mean higher resolution than standard CD quality 16-bit 44.1. Yeah, so there's a lot of 24-bit 48, 24-bit 88, 24-bit 96, 24, 192, it's out there. Great. <laughs> but has it made any difference? Has it made music sound better? It's just a number at this point because most of the music that I stream on Tidal and Kobuz that is, in quotes, high resolution, has been massively compressed and processed and EQ'd and auto-tuned and whatever. It doesn't sound let's say, demonstratedly better than a good quality recording that's been less compressed, less processed, less everything, that's 16-bit 44.1. So here's the underlying problem. In our time, most music has been recorded, mixed, and mastered to sound good on dot, 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 cheap earbuds, <laughs> crappy Bluetooth speakers, and in car systems, in car. That's reality. That's what, you know, 99% of the population, that's how they listen to music, all forms of music, classical, whatever, I don't care. All of it has been basically done to the lowest common denominator because very few music listeners are listening over nice systems or even listening in semi-quiet places. It's background to other activity. And the people making recordings know that. And that's what we get except for <laughs> people who are making audio file recordings. And that's a whole other story I'm not going to get into right now, but most labels are not interested in the audio file market because it's too, well, there's not enough of us. And then there was this little side trip with DVD audio that there was an announcement that Jackson Brown's Running on Empty album was going to come out in DVD audio surround sound. 5.1 channel surround. Great. And I thought to myself, this is really good because, you know, the thing about that, that record running on empty, it was a, a live recording, so to speak, but it was recorded in different, let's call it uh, venues, like on the tour bus. Some tracks were recorded supposedly on the tour bus and some in small venues and sometimes in hotel rooms. So every tune had a different environment and that would be phenomenal in a surround format. And then, oh, and then it came out. Well, they sent me in advance and they said, here it is. I said, fantastic. So I played it. I thought, you know, it's pretty good. I wouldn't say blow you away good, but it was good. And then a few days after I got it, I got a message from Warner Brothers saying, hold off on that. And by the way, send back that disc, which wasn't a production disc. It was a burned DVD audio disc. Okay, why? I said, well, it's not going to come out right now. I said, really? Why not? Anyway, I never got an answer. But it came out like a year or two later, but by then the party was sort of over 
with DVD audio. So things like that kept happening. <laughs> a really funny story was, oh, I think the best part, the best part of the SACD saga in terms of how to get this format out there was of all bands and of all labels, so to speak, was the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones put out all of their titles up until I think 1970, like up to Beggar's Banquet or so, or Get Your Yaya's Out, on SACD, not surround sound, but two channel SACD hybrid discs. Fantastic. And you know what they did? <laughs> they discontinued CDs of all of those titles that you could only buy the SACD. Oh, and better yet, it didn't say SACD on the packaging. No, you only became aware that it was an SACD when you, you know, took off the shrink wrap and saw on the inside it said SACD. And it said it's compatible with the CD, CD players. And if you have an SACD player, you'll hear it sound better on the SACD player. Fantastic. So to my way of thinking and what I am aware of in terms of the releases by major artists, the Rolling Stones have to win that game because for all of those titles, which we're still selling, you could only buy the SACD. And I thought that's the template for a successful format. Stop making CDs of a given title and then only release it on SACD as a hybrid disc. And there you go. Everybody will buy the SACDs. Or better yet, your, your new artists, your living artists, have them make only SACDs. And there you go. You win. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. But Sony, Phillips, never did that. So anyway, in preparing to do this video today, I went over to the Acoustic Sounds website to see what were the best-selling SACDs, because people are still buying SACDs. And I'll put up some images. They're all from way back when. They're all based on analog recordings. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, the best-selling SACDs of all time, or the best-selling SACDs right now, I should say, are all from long ago and far away. Not a single one <laughs> recorded to DSD. So I checked out Music Direct, another seller, online seller of SACD. I checked Amazon. I checked a Japanese site where supposedly SACD is doing a little better. Again, mostly analog recordings. So the promise of a better than CD quality format, which was what SACD was supposed to be, it had no traction then. Yeah, and I know, yes, I do know that there's classical music that comes out in the DSD format now and can sound great, and that's good. But I'm talking about the successful or the lack of success for DVD audio and SACD. <laughs> Another little side issue, and I wish I had taken a picture, at Tower Records in New York City, you could not buy the, the SACDs and DVD audio discs in the store that sold music. They had a separate store across the street for video. That's logical. But that's where they sold DVD audio and SACD. And there was a big sign over the rack. It was one rack. It wasn't like many racks. There was one sign over the rack that said, warning, do not buy these discs for your DVD player or CD player. They won't, they, we can't guarantee that they will play, so you won't be able to return them. Or words to that effect. So yeah, yeah, big format. Everybody loved it, except nobody really liked it, you know? And then the thing is, when Surround uh, started happening, matter of fact, there was a magazine that I was getting called Surround Sound Professional. And they predicted, again, in the early 2000s, that Surround Sound was going to be such a widely accepted format that very few people would be left recording to stereo. It's just yesterday's news. Like, why would you only want stereo when Surround Sound was so much better? And again, very, very, very few people were making recordings, new recordings in surround audio. Oh yeah, yeah, I do know that Stephen Wilson from Porcupine Tree in his own solo career is a major proponent of surround sound for music and has made some excellent recordings on his own and has remixed uh, Jethro Tull and King Crimson and other bands in surround from their recordings of long ago and far away. And he's excellent, he is phenomenal. I wish 
everybody in the industry understood surround sound as well as Stephen Wilson. But again, I don't see too many current living bands signing up and saying, Steve, we want you to make surround sound for us today. Well, here was a, there was another great little story about surround sound that was positive, was the Talking Heads had their entire studio collection remixed to surround sound by, I think, Jerry Harrison, who was in the band, the keyboard player for the band. And it came out in one big box set. It was called The Brick. And I got this thing, and I listened to it, and I thought, Jerry Harrison really gets it. Those surround mixes were phenomenal. They just, they made sense. They were logical. They just expanded the stereo mix. You could hear the things that were going on, the, the density of the uh, mixes so much more clearly. It was excellent. I interviewed him about it. And he said it took him a year to do all of their studio albums, the ones that were in the, in the, in the brick. Uh, and I said, you did it, man. You really nailed it. But they were so, those were so far and few between. They just so rarely happened. Most surround mixes, it appeared to me back in the time, I was writing reviews in a home theater magazine about DVD audio and SACD surround mixes. So many of them were just instruments thrown around like there's a guitar over there and there's a tambourine over there. It's just like, whatever, you know. So it, uh, it's really sad that so few musicians or engineers really got got it, learned what to do with surround sound. Uh, yes, Stephen Wilson, definitely Jerry Harrison, but I'll tell you somebody who didn't get it, and that was Mickey Hart. He remixed some uh, Grateful Dead records for DVD audio in surround, and they were pretty pathetic. And I interviewed him about it, and he was, <laughs> he was clueless. He was totally clueless as to what it was, what were its potential. It just never came together, this idea of mixing music for surround, you know? It's funny that the stereo format was a little rocky in the early days, but how the, the aesthetic of what stereo should be for pop music came together relatively quickly. Now here, so here we are in the 21st century, 2022, and it's still, surround mixes are pretty hit or miss and a lot more misses than hits. Of course, again, you guys can tell me about all the great new music, not remixes of 56 year old recordings, new music in surround that's incredible. Now, as for part three, my experiences in recording studios. Now, I'm not, I'm not a recording engineer. It's not like I've spent that many, that many recording studios, but enough and mixing studios and mastering studios to say that the sound I've heard in those places, mm, it wasn't uh, pleasing, it wasn't audiophile, it wasn't something I would want to spend my life listening to. You know, engineers use words like, it has to translate, the sound that they're hearing has to translate, meaning what they're hearing, how it will sound on other speakers, you know, in cars, on headphones, whatever, that what they're listening for isn't for pleasure, they're listening to, can I hear everything that I need to hear in the mix, as opposed to, wow, that sounds really beautiful. Oh, those vocals sound so lifelike. No, no, they don't think that way, at least most of the ones that I've spoken to and, the, and what I've heard out of studio systems. No, what studio engineers are looking for, whether they're recording engineers, mix net engineers, or mastering engineers, is this, to be able to hear what they need to hear in the mix. That's it. As far as I can tell, and again, I'm not a recording engineer by any stretch, but I have spent some time in studios and that's what it seems like to me. And what audiophiles are generally looking for is a sound that's pleasing to them, that makes their music, audiophiles, that makes their music sound good. Now, of course, some audiophiles are, you know, looking for highly analytical sound that they can hear everything, the good, and the bad <laughs> and the truly ugly in terms of massive, massively compressed, heavily processed, auto-tuned, whatever. They wanna hear every excruciating detail of that. And if that's, if that's you, sure, go for it, man. It's your money, <laughs> it's your ears. You should get what pleases you. But I, I gather, having spent my life in the audio biz in one form or another for over 40 years, that most audiophiles want a sound that makes their music sound good 
to them, which is the way it works. But that's true for everybody, the analytical audiophiles and the, let's say, euphonic loving audiophiles. Whatever it is, whatever floats your boat, that's what you should be going for. I have, <laughs> absolutely. There's no other way to approach this, really. You only have to please yourself. Okay, so we're going to get to the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day in just a few moments. But first, <laughs> or no, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about my previous review, the Enlium Amp 23R. Now, I reviewed this amplifier first and foremost because it's interesting, because it's not just another big hunking amplifier. No, it's tiny, really, really tiny. It sounds really good. It's built so beautifully. It's Jew like. When you touch it, you feel knob feel was extraordinary. That's why I did it. And because it sounds really, really good. Now, the thing is, I got a lot of comments that were from people that were upset about it because it was too expensive, because it was built in South Korea, and blah, blah, blah. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not here to sell you the thing. I'm here to tell you about it. If you're not interested, that's cool. <laughs> I'm not interested in a lot of things that other people are interested in. I don't get angry about it. I just say, I'm not, that's not my thing. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. Now, I review affordable products, sometimes extremely affordable products, where I find them interesting and everyday products and medium price and very high-end stuff. That's what I do here. I'm presenting a wide range of products and not just, I'm not just here to do reviews. I do interviews with audiophiles and you see them in their homes or the audiophiliac viewer system of the day. You get to see what your brethren uh, have at home. I, I'm here to provide entertainment. That's what I'm here to do. But anyway, Let's lighten up. That's what that's my point here is chill. <laughs> and speaking of chilling, it is now time for one of your systems, the Audiophiliac Viewer System of the Day. Today I've decided to do two viewer systems of the day. This one comes from Martin. He's from Argentina. He has a Gato Amp 150 integrated amplifier. I love it. Dyne Audio Confidence 20 speakers. REL T9i subwoofer, Cambridge Audio Azure 851N DAC streamer, and a Riga Apollo CD player. Nice going, Martin. This one comes from Daniel. He's 26 years old, and he just upgraded his speakers last night. And they are RTR G200s. They're pretty big. And the lower driver, by the way, he points out, is a passive radiator. He has a Musical Fidelity A3.2 dual mono integrated amp. He's using the built-in photo stage, but he also has a Musical Mini Photo Plus if he ever wants to try something different or listen through headphones. His turntable is a Fluence RT81. He's been, lately, he's been switching back and forth between two cartridges, a Nagaoka MP200 and a Pickering XSV3000, which is a vintage cartridge, but he does have a new stylus. Thanks, Daniel. We are back. Yes, we are. My name is Steve Guttenberg, and I continue to be the audiophiliac, and I'm proud to do so. If you like what I'm doing here on the channel, please consider joining my Patreon and support the channel. It's easy to do, a few bucks a month, up to $50 a month. That's all I got to say. Check out the, the website, and you will learn more. Some of you might have known, noticed that I now have a podcast. Yes, a podcast. It's not this show. It's completely different than this thing, although it stars me. <laughs> so anyway, check out my podcast. You can hear it on my own website, which is just for podcasts, but also on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and iHeartRadio and all those usual places that people hear podcasts. So please check it out. And speaking of please, if you like what I'm doing here on the channel, and I know a lot of you do, please hit that like button. The YouTube algorithm favors YouTube channels like this one if they get lots of likes. So please give me a like here and there when you think I deserve it. And speaking of deserving it, if you have yet to subscribe to this channel, please do so. And with that, I can say my work here is at last complete. Yes, it is. Thank you so much for watching. And I really, really do 
hope to see you back here again very, very soon. Bye-bye.